I'll just give it one more minute for anyone else that might be joining. All right, so in the interest of time, we'll get started. So thank you to everyone who's taken the time out of your day to join us here. Um, for those that are teachers, I can only imagine how busy it must be at this time, wrapping up uh, the school year. So we're really excited to have you here. We're really excited for this webinar as part of the Teach Earth webinar series. Um, so I'll just start with a little bit of an introduction about what's, what's to come up. Um, and as well, some just some housekeeping tips for Zoom for those that might be new with this software. Um, so at the top or the bottom of your screen, there should be a gray box. Um, and in that box, it should say Q and A as an option. Um, and that's where at the end of the webinar, we will have some time to address any questions that you might have that come up throughout. Um, so we won't be addressing those during the presentations. Um, but at the end, if you have any questions, you can type them in at any time and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Um, additionally, I will note we are recording the webinar um, so that, you know, if you have any colleagues that you think would want to watch this later on, maybe they were not able to join us here right now, um, that will be an option. We'll be putting it up on our EarthWatch YouTube channel uh, along with our other Teach Earth webinar recordings. Um, so that that will be an option as well. Um, but thanks again for joining us here today for our webinar on conserving wetlands and traditional agriculture in Mexico. Which there's, it's about the research and school group teams is what we'll be talking about today. Um, so we have two presenters that have taken some time as well from their busy schedules to join us. So first and foremost, meeting our presenters. So here with us today, we have Eric Yort, who is an Earthwatch field team leader. So he's one of the, the field staff on this Earthwatch expedition. Um, he started with Earthwatch back in March of 2016 um, as, an, as a guide at that time, uh, and then became an official member of the field staff uh, in August of 2017. And since then has really been a huge part of the Earthwatch team, um, supporting both this expedition and some of our other corporate programs in Mexico. Um, and has been working very hard recently on defending his thesis as he just received his master's in science, which is very exciting. Um, we're all very happy for him and looking forward to, to what's to come. Also with us as a presenter, we have Rose Chafee Cohen who is a 2016 Teach Earth alumni. Um, and she fielded back in 2016 as a fellow on climate change at the Arctic's edge, um, and then returned to the field on this very expedition in Mexico in March of this year with her students from school, um, where she teaches at the Kent Place School in Summit, New Jersey, as a science teacher. So we'll get to hear about Rose's experience and what it took to, to make that school group team happen um, and, and how that was in the field as well. So the agenda for this presentation, uh, we'll get first into just a brief history of the wetlands of Mexico City. Um, and this will all be coming first from Eric as a member of the field staff. Um, and he'll talk a bit about the research. So what happens in the field, why this research is important, what we've learned from the, the many years now that we've had this Earthwatch expedition and all the research that's been gathered and some exciting new questions that have been added to the research just this year. Um, and additionally, we'll learn from Rose about school group teams. What does it take to prepare a school group team? What's it like as a school group team on an Earthwatch expedition and the impact that this experience can have post fielding on your students? Um, and lastly, as I mentioned, we'll have some time for Q&A. So any questions that you have throughout the, the presentation that might come up, um, that'll be our chance to address them with your presenters. So with that, I will hand it over now to our first presenter, Eric. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us and greetings from Mexico. I'm actually in Mexico City, Mexico City right now. 
I'm going to give a brief introduction of the history of the wetlands here in Mexico. And I wanted to start this presentation by saying what happens when you type Xochimilco. If you're interested in Xochimilco and you type it at Google, this is what you get, uh, this image. So we have a very colorful uh, tradition in here, uh, very colorful uh, boats. And Xochimilco is very well known worldwide because of this. But there's more than, than that uh, in Xochimilco. And I think, let me get to, can we go to slide number two, please? Yes. So, well, as, you, as some of you might know, uh, Mexico City is located in what it was once Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire. And we can see in this next slide uh, that there was a big lake in, in what is now Mexico City, a, a lake system that consisted of, of five different lakes with very different water uh, characteristics. And this is where uh, the Aztecs decided to settle. Actually, we can see in, in, the, in the bottom picture that the, in our flag, the national flag, we can see uh, the lake still as well portrayed in there. So since then, uh, this was uh, a closed basin with, with no exit to the sea. And this is where Aztecs decided to build the city. It was, uh, there's a story about it, and I'm not gonna take so much time on doing it, but you can Google it and it's a great story as well. And there was also a very productive system that they developed in, in this in order to uh, uh, deal with this scarcity of land because, because they, they were living on top of the lake, they decided, they decided to build. So the Chinampas, introducing you, the Chinampas in here. So can we, what can we say about the Chinampas? The Chinampas were man-made island, islands and they were built because uh, there was no other, any other place to build and it actually was a very productive system and this high productivity actually permitted the Aztec uh, population, the Tenochtitlan population, to reach some say, some say uh, around 200,000 people in the capital. So it, uh, here we can see an image in, in, we can, uh, in how, how the Chinampas were in, in that time. It was a piece of land surrounded by canals. And to this day, we still have some of that, of that Chinampas. Has this picture, we, would, we took them uh, a couple of weeks ago with a drone, uh, a participant was, was helping us with this. And this is the remaining of that agricultural system. But uh, a lot of changes have happened since those times. Uh, the first big challenge, the, the, big, the first big change was, for example, when the Spaniards arrived, they introduced new cultures, new ways of, of producing. They also, the, 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 for, the, the deforestation was intensified and how they deal with water, they deal it in a very different way than the Aztecs did. So since then, Tenochtitlan here, we can see a portrait by Diego Rivera. Now we can see what is now Mexico City. So the whole lake system was drained totally. So what, what it was, was uh, the, the, the second biggest lake in the whole country. Now we have only 2% of the, of the original uh, lake system. And this is, why, this is because part of the Xochimilco, which plays a big uh, percentage on this, uh, this 2%, it is protected by several uh, declarations by, by food and agriculture, it's a Ramsar site, it's a natural protected area. So in, in the other picture, we can see how the city eat uh, the whole lake system. And there's no, nothing much right now. So the research we are conducting uh, is very focused on maintaining Xochimilco, but also maintaining the diversity of the Chinampas. We believe that in those times, uh, the Chinampas agricultural production system allowed a lot of uh, biodiversity. It was a very sustainable way of producing food uh, in, in that time. So we have six endemic species. We have around 146 mm. plant species, some of them aquatic plants, and also around 140 40 species of vertebrates. Most of them are migratory birds because Mexico City, as we can see in the bottom pictures, is in the way of a lot of uh, migratory routes. 
And here we have one of the main uh, characters in this story, which is the Ambistoma Mexicano, Mexicanum, aka the Ajolote, or the Acholote. So this is a very interesting creature. This is an amphibian that has a strategy, a survival strategy, in which it never uh, leaves the, the water. So it never uh, finishes its metamorphosis process to become a salamander. It, it is in, the, in, in between, between a tadpole and a salamander. And this, this gives them a lot of interesting features. For example, the rege regeneration. They are able to regenerate very complex uh, limbs or organ organs like eyes, part of the heart as well. And it, it was very part of the culture back in then and still in Mexico City plays a big role. So we're using the ajolote as an umbrella species. Which, what is this? An, an umbrella species is a conservation tool that we use. Uh, if we protect this animal, we protect a lot of the animals as well. This, is, this, is, this has been used in a lot of uh, different examples in Yellowstone in, in more parks in which by conserving, preserving only one species, you can set uh, all the requirements for the other species and the whole ecological community, you protect them by, by conserving only one species. And since the ajolote is an endemic species of, of this system, we are actually uh, using this as a strategy for conservation. Um, we are working in a small site of the Xochimilco Lake system in the first picture, we can see where Xochimilco is located in the whole metropolitan area. It's at the south part of Mexico City. So this small polygon is the natural protected area of Xochimilco. And we can see pointed out uh, the study site, which is the San Gregorio. And we, we selected this site because a lot of producers still conserve uh, their traditional chinampa use in there. So this, we have done this for three years at least. And we have sampled over 90 sampling points per year. So that's a ton of work. And with the help of, all, of volunteers, that's how we can do this kind of stuff <laughs> over this time. So we have identified a lot of the environmental pressures. For example, there is some treated wastewater because there are a lot, there's a lot of invasion from houses in the Chinampas. They are occupying the Chinampas. Uh, there are also agricultural runoffs with pesticides and fertilizers fertilizers counted. And we also have introduced, introduced species such as uh, tilapia and carp, and also introduced plant species as well. And this has changed the whole web structure and also causing some algal blooms in, in the Suchimilco system. So Suchimilco, it's uh, very clear, you can see that it is eutrophic, it is eutrophicated, <laughs> which means that there is an excess uh, production in the amount of nutrients and it degrades the water quality. So we know a lot of stuff uh, about such an ecosystem during this research. Uh, we know that in some, in some places, most of the cases, the maximum uh, permissive limits for agricultural irrigation, irrigation are surpassed, surpassed. And there is a high concentration of suspended particles that reduces the penetration of light, for example, and inhibit, inhibits the photosynthesis of, of the other different plant species. And the organic matter uh, plays a big role in this whole system, make, making changes in the behavior and the position of contaminants. So there's also some uh, pesticide residues, and there's also different ratios that go off the scale in, in with nutrients, for example, the, the ratio with carbon nitrogen, it's totally upscale. So we have, we have focus on water sampling mainly, and here we can see some of the pictures and some of the activities that we have done uh, with the students group. In this case, we can take first uh, the physical chemical characteristics of water, namely temperature, turbidity, etc. We use some electronic probes to do this. We also measure the morphometry of canals, and this is something that we found since uh, the last year. For example, this plays also a big role, so we're taking a lot of measures, very detailed measures about that. We're also monitoring the amount of bacteria, uh, because this is also an irrigation land. We have, we have a map in there in which we can see the, the, the changes in this, 
this counts. We also, since the turbidity and the, the light that cannot reach in a certain pass, uh, well, certain deep of the water column, we take a lot of time also to analyze different parts of the suspended solids. Some also, uh, we analyze the food and phytoplankton. I'm going to speak, to, I'm going to review this later because this is one of the key aspects uh, for the reintroduction of ajolote. This is the food for the ajolote, the food for the ajolote in its early stages, the food for the ajolote in his mature stages. And there's competition for this resource, and we had to play and we had to know how to manage this kind of resource. So there's a lot of uh, developing in. in in what are the best composition of these two, these two groups that could have a better benefit for the ajolote. Mm -hmm. In some other cases, uh, the samples, we cannot, we're not able to process them, but we carry them and we take them to the National Univer Autonomous University of Mexico. And we have here, we have the PI of the investigation, Dr. Claudia Ponce. And in here we take, for, the, for example, they analyze the, nit the nitrate and phosphate content, the organic carbon content, etc. We also do some soil chromatography, and this is a, a technique that we use to help farmers as well. Now we are getting out of the water matrix and analyzing the interaction between the soil and the water. And we have seen uh, some of examples as well. This is a participatory method. That means that we are also working with the farmers for them to learn this technique. And this is a very interesting technique that can be done elsewhere. And the management uh, of the chinampas has a big, uh, you can see the, the results in the chromatic level. So this is a very interesting technique also that we like to do. And we have, get, we have done a lot of stuff during these years. And the only thing that we can, <laughs> that we can conclude is that it is a very, very highly complex agroecological system. So it is, it is a closed system. It is totally managed by men. It's no longer a natural environment. And it, it, it variates a lot from time to time, from canal to canal, from year to year, from season to season. So we are identifying, for example, the biggest streets and their interaction of those streets in the system. Since then, we are taking more precise actions for the conservation of the ajolote, and we are developing some skills with the farmers as well, so they can help us in embracing this uh, conservation task. We are making them also participants of, of, of this important task in Suchimilco, and we are giving more visibility to the origin of conserving Suchimilco as a whole system in a climate change scenario. Right now, this year, it hasn't rained at all, and we are almost in the middle of the rainy season, and it is very disturbing to, 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 to feel that. So uh, during these three years, there is a ton of stuff that we, we have done. Some of them it is very uh, theoretical and not, not theoretical, very uh, precise and in, in some aspects. So there, there are some papers that have uh, been published in, in, in this, re this research. Uh, but we have accounted, for example, the importance of preserving the, the whole food with. Uh, no matter if we reproduce the ajolotes in captivity and then we take them to environment even if they have a right the right amounts of oxygen for example they need food and they need good quality uh, of food so this is a key step for the this is a key step for the for introduction of the ajolote we have seen some correlations uh, between the abiotic parameters and the organisms the correlation between the amount of rotifers a certain kind of zooplankton and the amount of suspended solids in the water, that's something that, that is, it has come very interesting after these years of, of work and also that the fish species also play a big role in, in, in disturbing the environment. Uh, the erosion of the chinampas, conserving the traditional chinampa use, not, not uh, more modern farming techniques is also very important in, in this area and the conditions, as I said before, of the canals, how the canals are organized as also. And after this, uh, this research, we have generated uh, a plan for the reintroduction of the ajolote, and we have taken into account all of the variables that we have seen 
and actually put them into practice. And during this uh, upcoming expeditions, we're going to prove that uh, for the next few years. We are building shelters for the ajolote, uh, and we are going to try to to prove if if our findings were were uh, correct. If we manage the food with, if we manage uh, the aquatic plants uh, in the system, if we take part that also the, the shape and the depth, the width of the canal plays a big role. We have selected some sites that, that satisfy the, this criteria. Then we will be able to maintain uh, populations of ajolotes in, in, in these canals. So the, the, the upcoming groups that are coming uh, during this time, they're gonna help us besides uh, taking more information of the whole uh, Milko San Gregorio system, there, you, the next groups will be helping us on also proving this hypothesis that we have. Uh, and we are taking a lot of, we're, we're actually controlling every aspect of those canals during this next, next years. So, well, this is a brief explanation, of, <laughs> a very brief explanation of what, what the research is about. And I'm looking forward, probably there will be a lot of questions, but we, we can use the, the time at, at the end of this presentation to, fulfill, to, to solve those questions. But I'd like to hand over now to, to Rose so she can speak about her experience <laughs> uh, with us in, uh, during the expedition, during the time she, she was with us. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, I, I guess I would start actually on a, a slightly personal note. Um, you heard Dana mention that I participated in the Teach Earth program um, with climate change at the Arctic edge um, back a few years ago. And one of the reasons I got so interested in participating in this kind of program was I felt like I sort of had a little bit of gap in my experience and training related to authentic research or lab experiences or, you know, what it really was like to do science. And so as a teacher, I was really excited to get some more insights into that. And I felt like by participating in these Earthwatch programs, where you got to work right alongside um, people who were involved in the research and you got to do the research, that that would kind of fill a need um, that I had professionally and um, what I could bring to my students. So that was something that, that motivated me um, not only to participate in the fellowship program, but then to get my students involved. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the planning process and an organizing process with my students and then also... Um, a little bit about like what it's like to be in the field on one of these programs. There's a little little delay in the slide, but it'll come up in a moment. Um, and so the first thing that I want to talk a little bit about is is how do we how do you put a team together? Um, and for for my particular school, we do run other global trips, and so. I needed to sort of make the case that this was a unique kind of trip and set it apart from the other types of trips that we're running that might have been either related to um, arts groups that were traveling or cultural um, immersion types of trips. And so I had to figure out like, what is it that makes this trip unique and something that's gonna attract a certain kind of student. So some of the things that I tried to emphasize um, in making different announcements, both you know, in my classes and even inviting students to join, I tried to emphasize um, that we were doing authentic STEM research, um, where they're going to they're going to be working with um, you know the lead researchers and the whole team, where they would get to do field work and and all different kinds of work in the field, where they go to the lab, they would collaborate as a team to, you know, kind of problem solve different tasks, they would get their hands dirty. Um, and so that was kind of one aspect of, of what makes an Earthwatch trip unique, regardless of which one you go on. And, and of course, I'm partial to this one because I think it really does deliver on, on those types of goals. Um, it's also a, a trip where you're learning about um, an issue that has both um, 
has both like a global lens and a local lens. Like we can all relate to different issues related to either water quality or water quantity. And so we get to see a particular place and context for this issue in going to Mexico City, but students are gonna be able to come back and think about local water issues and make those connections um, between those things. And not only water issues, but also things that come into play are just you know ecological um, systems, agriculture, urbanization, and also the cultural and historical context of, of the place and how it connects to all those other pieces. Um, and then something that I think uh, my students really gravitate towards is a trip where they feel like they're going to be able to make a contribution and make a difference. And so by participating in this research and learning about these environmental issues and perhaps bringing that back into action in their own communities, it really has that type of an angle too. Um, so those are the things that I tried to use to recruit my team um, and get them excited to join. Um, but I will say also that I think that you have to kind of help the students self-select if this is the right kind of trip for them in the sense that um, they're gonna be spending a lot of time out outdoors. They're gonna be getting dirty. They're gonna be tired at the end of the day. Um, but it's all very rewarding. So just knowing what they're getting into, I think helps, even if they've never done those things before, as long as they're kind of open to that type of experience, I think that's what you're looking for. Um, because Eric and their team will make sure that no matter their experience level, that like they have an entry point to learn and feel comfortable and grow in the experience. Um, so that's, those are some things I wanted to say about building the team. In terms of pre-trip meetings, we actually, you know, once we knew the students who were coming, um, getting to know their dynamic and helping them build a dynamic was also part of what we tried to plan in. So um, what was really great is that, um, you know, we had an Earthwatch staff member come down to our school and meet with us and help us understand like, what is the Earthwatch mission all about? And what is Earthwatch doing all over the world? And then also here in Mexico City. Um, we also did a number of things just to help start building team and community within our group. Our group was a little bit smaller, but I think especially with a larger group, you would want to help people get to know each other in advance and maybe understand like what assets and also challenges they're bringing to the group because um, because the days are long, because the work is hard. You kind of want to have, have a good sense of how they're going to interact and work together. Um, we had also done a little work around cultural competencies and just what does it mean to travel to a new country if you've never been, been to one before. Um, and how do you um, observe and ask questions before making judgments about something that might be different from your own community, your own culture. Um, so I think that, that that can be helpful and I'm sure also that the Earthwatch staff is, help, is uh, willing to help you come up with different ways to accomplish those types of goals. Um, but I think that did set us up for success once we were on the ground in Mexico City um, because teamwork is a big part of this process. Um, let's see, in terms of working with families, um, I, again, we, I mentioned that I think like sort of students knowing what they're getting into and families knowing what the, the trip is like is helpful because that helps temper expectations versus realities. So for example, knowing perhaps that, um, you know, that there's not going to be a lot of downtime. There's not going to be a lot of tourism like as part of this trip. It's a different kind of trip and they're going to take away different things from this type of trip. But um, if you communicate that up front, they know, they know what the goals and outcomes of, of the trip are. Um, the same thing might come relate to uh, risks. So, you know, people in traveling to new countries, sometimes they have concerns or they have misconceptions about what the risks may or may not be. So helping be upfront about those things. And uh, I find that the program guides are very comprehensive and there's a lot of information in there to help you understand um, all of the planning that goes into place for risk. So, you know, in particular in Mexico City, we uh, talked about earthquakes. We talked about when we were in the Chinampas, how do we minimize risk with water quality, contamination, that type of thing. Um, 
So, so I think being upfront about that is very helpful. Um, and the, along the same lines, communication in the field. So, um, you know, because we're out in the field doing work all day, like the kids are not accessible to communicate back home and maybe they will be in the evenings, but um, we, we took the approach of sort of like checking in in the evenings um, when there were when there was something to to share, but um, you know when you travel, some of those things are a little different than the norm, and so just making sure they have the information. Um, in terms of travel planning, some things that I might share. Um, um, are again like the program guides are really comprehensive in terms of packing lists and you actually do need all of the things on the list um but with my students also helping them understand like you don't need to necessarily go out and buy every anything like lots of new things you can figure out ways to you know make sure you have what you need but um i think the earthwatch is really good about identifying things that are going to make sure everyone is safe and comfortable and has what they need um and Eric's team and the whole Earthwatch team also um, was great in terms of answering questions that we had. Like students wanted to know how to say certain things in Spanish, or they wanted to know that if this food accommodation was going to be able to be met. And everyone was very responsive in helping us, like made people feel comfortable with all of those basic needs so that they could do the work when they got um, in the field. Um, so just a little bit more about life on the expedition and once you actually get there. Um, so first I'll talk a little bit about uh, field work. Um, so, you know, one of the great things about this program is there's just so many hands-on things for students to do. So you, you saw in, in Eric's slides, they got to do soil sampling, water quality, um, bacteria, all sorts of different tasks and um, all of the staff that we worked with, there's a, you know, a, a different number of people that were there um, as part of the team, were just so willing to teach us and be patient and work with us and so knowledgeable about the project and, um, and all aspects of the project that um, you know, the students really got to uh, be immersed in, in all of that. Um, and we also, tended to mix up the teams and the different tasks from day to day. So students really got to do all of these different things um, throughout the course of the project. So there's a bit of travel time built in as part of the, the field work because you have to get actually get to the field. Um, but that also was a good time for them to be observing the the area around them to be reflecting on um, how they wanted to start the day or what we had accomplished that day. Um, and so um, those days were long, but but again, you're tired, but in the best way possible. Um, so we'd return in the evening and have a little bit of free time, but uh, we also, the learning kind of continued and that varied from day to day. So sometimes you saw we were doing the soil chrom chromatography lab. Sometimes we were at the university lab and kind of seeing the really high tech um, analytical um, machinery they had there. Um, and then sometimes we got to do other things like go to the botanic gardens um, that were nearby. So a little bit varied, but again, long, really satisfying days. Um, and in terms of exploring the community, so I mentioned a few of the things. So, you know, they, they did set aside some time in the middle of the week and at the end for us to um, kind of see some of the different unique sites um, in that part of Mexico City or to go to museums and see um, work by Diego Rivera, Alfredo Kahlo, or, and other also um, um, ancient artifacts too. So, um, we definitely got a taste of those pieces as well. And the, um, it was a bit personalized too, based on what we, what we really wanted to prioritize our student, what they were interested in and, and that kind of thing. Um, and what, one of the things our students really actually loved too was the language practice that they got, uh, whether they, when they were out in the community or working with the field staff, we had some students who were Spanish scholars, so they were really excited to, to practice where they could, um, but it's definitely not a pre prerequisite. Um, and then the last thing I'll add on is just about um, the accommodations and food, because again, like knowing you're gonna be in a comfortable environment and that your belly is gonna be feeling satisfied, like all of that is kind of base level to 
doing the hard work of, of uh, working in the field. And I would say Casa Shitla was such a fantastic accommodation for us because it was very tranquil. We got to come back to the beautiful trees and birds and dogs that <laughs> lived at the casa. Um, and so it was a very like calm place for us to come back to. Very simple um, accommodations. Um, and so they take um, an approach that is, is really thoughtful about sustainability and community um, and sharing spaces. And so I thought that that was a really like a great message that um, dovetailed really nicely with the program as a whole. And they also have great chefs there to make uh, really authentic food um, and definitely try to accommodate different dietary needs and things like that. So um, it was a very comfortable but basic place for us to stay. So again, like you're not going to sort of a holiday inn or something like that, but I think that you don't necessarily want that either. Um, and our students really had a great time there and it was very safe and comfortable for them um, with both dormitory spaces and learning spaces there. So I think on the next slide, you can see a couple of um, takeaway quotes from students. Uh, I'm not sure, are these all Kent Place students or others too? These are all Kent Place students um, yeah. that went on the program. And um, I would say for the most part, the students that went on this trip are students that are very enthusiastic about science. And I think that their enthusiasm was only heightened by participating in this program. They saw a lot of connections between what they were learning on this program and um, in my chemistry class. I had two of the students in my chemistry class. Um, but the great thing about this program um, from a high school perspective is there's a lot that connects to biology, to chemistry, environmental science, and that's just topical, right? But what they're really taking away is also just the skills of doing science and thinking like a scientist and kind of seeing the complexities of a system like this. So um, that is, you know, universal to uh, kind of any science program. And, and I, sorry, I want to add just one other thing because I really think it is important to think beyond science here too, even though I'm a science teacher, I'm a little biased, but um, the leadership and teamwork that comes out of an experience like this and the bonding that students can, can undertake when they do this kind of work together, um, I think that that's also something to be emphasized for this kind of program. Awesome, I'm, I'm even gonna add to that. I think one of my personal favorite parts about this expedition that time and time again when I talk with teachers about it, whether it's for their own experiences to bring back to the classroom or if you're thinking of bringing your students out there, is that in addition to the science, there's just so many different subjects that just come together on this expedition, whether it's the science, whether it's the history, like what Eric was talking about at the start, there's so much history that goes into this landscape, into the science and research that's being done, um, into the Spanish that's also a part of it. Um, there's just so many ways to bring it across subjects that I think really nicely just ties into different students, different interests in school um, that means it's just all the more reason that you don't need to be an expert scientist to join the teams and to get a lot out of it based on what you're really passionate about um, but yeah i think with that that does wrap up the presentations thank you eric thank you rose so much uh, for sharing about um, both the expedition and what it takes to get a school group out there um, with that, we can move to any questions that the listeners might have um, that came up throughout. So I'll just, I'll read the questions and then if Eric or Rose, depending if you want to answer as you see fit. Um, well, the first question is for Eric, um, wondering if you're going to be on, we've got our Teach Earth 2019 team coming up this July. Uh, will you be on that team? Will you be there in the field? Yes, I will be. <laughs> I'll be still the, the team leader for this whole year. We have uh, all the schedule. Well, everything is scheduled. And yes, I'll, I'll be still the, the guy and the team leader. Excellent. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, let's see, what other questions? Um, regarding the earthquakes that were brought up as a safety concern, and there having been one a couple years ago, 
Um, there's a question about whether or not that had any direct impact on the chinampas and, and all the research. Well, well the, the ajolotes, we, a couple of years ago, we were able to find ajolotes in, in some of the San Gregorio. And that's probably why we selected San Gregorio uh, as our main study site, because that part still, because they weren't using uh, so much chemicals, for example, the farmers, that allowed, allowed a lot of the, of the ajolotes to survive. Probably also there's a, a lake system around, so that contributes to to that. Uh, nowadays, uh, I had a graph in, in the presentation that ten years ago, let's no, twenty years ago almost, uh, the number has 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 been to the ground totally. So we were able a couple of years ago, eight years ago, we put some traps. And we could find some acolotes, not very, not, not so many, but a couple. And right now it has been two years since we have putting traps in different places, checking them, and we're not able to find any acolotes now. So, I mean, the, sure, there are still some acolotes in the environment, but I don't think there are many. I think they are almost about to, to be totally disappear in, in the in Suchimilco and in the San Gregorio area as well. That is very bad news, but uh, on the other hand, uh, the reproduction of the ajolote, uh, it is very easy. And there are many colonies because it has, uh, it is for interest in science, medical issues, because of this regeneration capabilities that the ajolote has. So there's a lot of big colonies around the world, in Japan, in Kentucky, in, in the UK, I can recall some of them. So if we manage to, to preserve the, the Xochimilco area, we manage not, uh, not well, to stop that uh, disappearing of the, of the chinampas and, and the water quality could go to could improve, then we, we, I think we can still reintroduce that a lot effectively. So it is, it is uh, threatened. Well, uh, it is list in, in CITES, CITES. Uh, as, a, as a threatened spe species, yes, but because of that uh, capability to introduce, to, to reproduce them, uh, it is not uh, actually extinct. We can say right now that at this point it is ecologically extinct because it doesn't do anything right now. The, the population that, have, that are, are just thriving not really contributing to the system. It was really interesting. We got to see in, in Claudia's lab um, where they were like propagating and manipulating Ashlot, um for their like environment to be maybe reintroduced or just to understand them better. So that was, that was a, a treat for that visit. So another question we have is for Rose and whether or not you, were you the only teacher planning this whole trip or did you have additional support and how much support, if so, did it, did it take to make this all happen? Yeah, um, well, I was the lead um, organizer for this trip and uh, there was one other chaperone. We had a pretty small group. Um, we had originally planned for a third chaperone, but um, so, but I actually found that like just the support of the Earthwatch staff really helped um, both keep me on track in terms of what they needed at different times. And then also because they had a lot of their like paperwork electronically, students could be uploading and families could be uploading electronically. And then they would let me know if any were missing or, and they, so they did a lot to help coordinate that logistical side. So for me, it was more like getting the students prepared for the experience and um, making sure that they like knew what to bring and you know answering their questions and stuff like that um and and once you got to the on the ground um and the, and the um the program team like met you as well like they're with you every step of the way to help support um too so i fit i find that it really is um it really is manageable in terms of the planning okay let's see um 
how has tourism influenced the chinampas in comparison to the ornamental plant trade? Well, the thing that happens right now with tourism is that chinampas are switching from the traditional chinampa use, which is a farming place, to, let's say, it, a soccer field, a place where you can stay overnight, a, a small uh, cabin, for example. So the, they're switching. And if you put a cabin, probably you'll start having a drainage. If you bring people uh, and have a meeting in there, a wedding probably, celebrating something, then you'll start to have discharges uh, of human waste. So that is not contributing uh, to, the, to the chinampas at this point because it is not properly managed. So in, in some cases, big part of the Xochimilco, the, in, in the map, I mentioned before, that is mainly a different kinds of, of land use rather than chinampas. Most of them are, uh, in some places they have ajolotes kept in captivity, so visitors can come and, and enter them. But what we think is that the, there's no reason to preserve the chinampas if they're, in, a lot of the chinampas are also abandoned. <laughs> so, I mean, the tourism is changing a lot. Uh, uh, the, the, yeah, the, the, the economical activities around the, the Chinampas. And what it has left is that the first picture that I sent you, that I showed you in which the colorful boats, everything restricts right now to, the, to those colorful boats. They don't, they don't uh, enter the Chinampas most of the time and they just stay in those boats. Uh, the, ornamental, the ornamental plants in here, we have also ornamental plants and it is growing a lot because there is, there's a bigger profit for them. But ornamental, ornamental plants are using the chinampas just, just as, a, as a ground. There is no interaction between the sediment. Part of the chinampas uh, old ways uh, of doing it is that you have to take the sediment from the bottom of the canal putting in, in the chinampa. So that's how you have a very rich, organic rich uh, soil, organic, uh, yeah, organic material. So, and the ornamental plants, they bring, uh, they bring uh, manure from other places and they just put it in the pots and they, they don't, there's no mixture with, uh, there's no involvement in more than that. They just use the water of the canals to, to, to water the, the plants, but Nothing more than that. And also there's a lot of plastic involved in, in that process. All right, let's see. Um, can you speak a bit more about invasive species in the Chinampa ecosystem and how they impact water quality and agriculture? Mm, okay, so we have we, we have two invasive species. Uh, the first one is, uh, well, we have three. Two of them are fishes, and the third one is a plant. The one that, the, the picture we're looking right now, it has a plant which is uh, a water hyacinth that comes from the Amazonian. And for example, these plants, they remove a lot of, of the nitrogen and phosphate in the water, but they also, when they die, they, sink to the bottom and they decompose. So they're not contributing uh, at that point to, the, to better water quality. In the case, if, you, if you're able to remove them, probably you, you will have to do it all the time so, you, so the nutrients are taken in by the plants and then back to the agricultural fields. That's the case uh, of the water hyacinth. The carpon tilapia was introduced during the 70s just to give farmers uh, a, a different, a new source of protein. So what happens is, for example, the carp uh, removes a lot of the sediment in the bottom. So that changes a lot of the water quality. And since we are measuring also the amount of suspended so, uh, sediments in the, in the water column, uh, we are we're hypothesizing, we just need to prove it, that the carps are taking a big role in, in making that, in establishing those unhealthy conditions. The other hand, the, the tilapia is a very strong competitor to the ajolote, and it can even eat the small ajolotes, or 
it can uh, compete for the food uh, with the ajolote, making, and you know, the, 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 the tilapias move very fast, they, and the ajolote, and, be, and they are thus uh, better uh, hunters than the ajolote. So the ajolote is in a big disadvantage, and that's why also its populations are, are going down. I have to say, sorry, I was, I was reading the question, the first question that I, that I was, the answer, I, it actually was, I was reading that. So the first question that you asked me, Dana, sorry, <laughs> I got confused by that. I prefer to read. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So uh, speaking about that first question is that, well, there's, there's a big agricultural tradition in Xochimilco and it, it has a very, interesting heritage and it's also very productive so i have read this 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 came yesterday at night because i was looking for pictures of the chinampas and i have seen that it's also recognized as a chinampa which is kind of weird but they are using they're using this kind of method in bali so they're planting uh, the same way uh, in some other places besides mexico and an interesting thing is that they are calling them chinampas. So that, that's interesting that, because they, they kind of maintain the, the, the reference for that. <laughs> All right. Was that, so were you just addressing then that last question on what do you hope the Americans, that one? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so that looks like the last question that we have here. Are there any final questions before we wrap up the webinar otherwise all right well thank you again eric and rose for taking the time to share about your experiences and the roles that you've played in in this expedition um i think First and foremost, if anyone, if there's a teacher listening that's interested in making this happen for a group of students, um, that you are welcome to contact us at fellowshipawards at earthwatch.org and we will just get you in touch with our fantastic staff here um, that focus on our school group teams and as Rose mentioned, are just a great support system in helping you just check off all the boxes of what needs to happen to, to prepare and just getting you ready to head into the field. Um, this is a fantastic expedition. I cannot speak highly enough for school group teams, um, but we do have plenty of other expeditions as well um, that you can take students out on. Uh, typically the students would be their high school students um, between the ages of 15 to 18 years of age. Um, that can consider going out on these expeditions, getting that hands-on learning experience. Um, but we also have our teachers, our teacher earth teams that go on this expedition. So it's another opportunity um, for you as the teacher to just get that experience and bring it back to the classroom. Um, so fellowship awards, that's the email address to contact if you just wanna have more information about how to make that happen for your school. Um, or just any additional questions you might have after listening to this webinar. Um, if you're watching this as a recording, um, you might have some questions that weren't addressed in the Q&A, so you're happy to reach out and we will do our best to get those answered for you. I think otherwise, another great opportunity to contact that email address is if, if you're interested, I mean, this is our Teach Earth webinar series. Um, we aim to do this about three to four times a year and we're always looking for ideas for new presentation topics. If you as a teacher wanna present or want to nominate someone else, um, you can contact us at this email address and we can see what we can do to make that happen. Um, but otherwise, thank you all of you for taking the time again to join. We hope you found something very helpful out of this whole, whole webinar, whether it's preparing as you are about to join this very expedition or are thinking about bringing it back to your students in school. Um, we hope you enjoyed. So thank you so much and have a great evening or afternoon. Mm -hmm. Bye guys. Thanks everyone. <laughs>